and then the fact that it's not strong makes it easy to break. Uh, okay, so any questions about that stuff? Okay, uh, the last sort of odds and ends sort of topic here that I want to cover in this chapter is CAPTCHA. You all know and love CAPTCHAs, right? Yes. Uh, okay, before we get to CAPTCHAs, we need to take a little, uh, mention it, the idea of a Turing test. Okay, so this was proposed by Alan Turing in 1950. And what it is, is um, he was interested in the question, when, you know, people had started to talk about artificial intelligence. And the question was, when could you tell that something had actually met some standard in artificial intelligence? What should the standard be, you know, to call this thing intelligent? So, you know, he said, well, it's a computer, you know, it looks different from a human and all this, so we can't really use visual cues or something like that. So here's the idea. So we'll have somebody sit here in a room at a terminal, and there's two entities out there that they can ask questions to. One of them's human, one of them's a computer. Now, they can ask anything they want, they get the responses back, right? Now, if they can't tell which one's the human and which one's the computer with better than, you know, guessing, then we'll say that that computer's achieved artificial intelligence. Sounds reasonable, okay? Uh, and it's considered the gold standard, I guess, in artificial intelligence. Uh, nobody's passed it, there is actually a, 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 somebody out there that has some reward, I forget exactly how much it is, for anybody who, uh, the first to pass the Turing test. But they are claimed that they're getting close, okay? Each year they get a little bit better, a little bit better. Maybe the computer on Jeopardy's, you know, can enter this the Turing test. Uh, okay, so CAPTCHA. Okay, what does this have to do with CAPTCHA? Well, CAPTCHA being the worst acronym in the history of acronyms stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. <laughs> oh, I just hate that one. <laughs> okay, so take, let's take this apart. So what's the automated? Uh, automated means it's a test, right? So you have to take this test. The test is generated and scored by a computer, so no human intervention on that, that end is required. It's public, this is important, it's public in this, this is like a Kirchhoff's principle kind of thing. It's public in the sense that the code and the data that the, uh, the program is using, all that's public knowledge. So it's, the assumption is the attacker gets to see the code, gets to see how this thing actually works. So we're not relying on you know, secrets at, at that level. So that's good, you know, they can do it. Uh, this Turing test business, so the idea is that humans can pass it, but computers or automated processes should not be able to pass it. So what does that have to do with the Turing test? I guess it's sort of, you know, flip, you know inverse Turing test or something like that. Now this term, CAPTCHA, is technically uh, copyrighted. <laughs> So a lot of people use the term HIP, Human Interactive Proof. That's even worse. So CAPTCHA, HIP, I don't care, but we'll probably say CAPTCHA here. OK, so there's a paradox here, if you think about it. What's the paradox? The paradox is you have a computer here that's generating the test, right? And the computer scores the test. but. No computer can pass the test, right? That's the whole point. Okay, so that sounds a little paradoxical. So in other words, from some article, it captures a program that can generate and grade tests that it itself cannot pass, much like some professors. <laughs> okay. uh, so again, the paradox is the computer creates and scores the test, but it itself could not pass such a test. And that's the goal, at least. Uh, and again, the point here is we want some way to restrict access to humans, okay? So computers or automated processes cannot get access. Where are these things used? You see them all the time, right? Where do you have to solve CAPTCHAs? Gmail. Gmail, okay. Why, why would you care that it's a human and not a computer trying to get a Gmail account? Computers like to advertise um, Body enlargement services. <laughs> <laughs> Body enlargement. Okay, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the point is it could be spammers, right? So you want to protect from spammers. Anywhere else? Where else do you see these things? 
And I see them everywhere, everywhere I go. I'm supposed to solve a caption. It just gets kind of annoying after a while. But What's it? Uh, multiple password. Okay, so yeah, so uh, they want to check this password cracking, right? If you're someone's automatically trying to crack passwords, that's a very good use for captchas and so on. Uh, there's some interesting, as you'll see in the homework, there's actually some interesting uses of captchas. There's a, a project called the reCAPTCHA, and I'll give you that as a homework. Um, at least 265, I don't know about 166. Um, but the idea is they will give you two captchas, right? And you've come across these places, they ask you to solve two things. And what's really going on there is one of them is a CAPTCHA. The other one comes from like an OCR problem. So they're automatically trying to scan in, you know, books or something. And so they have something they're not sure about. So if the real CAPTCHA is <coughs> solved correctly, they will assume that the other one was solved correctly too, and they will update the information. So they're actually putting your, you know, work to uh, use in that case, but making it twice as annoying in the process. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the bottom line here, it's a form of access control, okay, restricting access to humans as opposed to automated processes. Okay, where are they used? As we mentioned, uh, email accounts and so on. Okay, now, okay, so original motivation, where did this come from? Uh, according to the folklore, there was a survey online, and it's asking people to vote for the best computer science school in the country. And of course, it was neck and neck between San Jose State and San Jose. <laughs> No, actually what was going on is, you know, this was a site that very few people would even look at, right? And so there was, a, you know, half a dozen votes for Carnegie Mellon and half a dozen votes for MIT. And then suddenly there were like thousands of votes for MIT. And then suddenly there were thousands of votes for Carnegie Mellon and then tens of thousands and tens of thousands. And, you know, what's going on? Somebody wrote a script <laughs> and went in and voted a lot of times, right? Uh, and so uh, a group at Carnegie Mellon actually got interested in this problem. Is there some way that we could restrict access and make sure it's actually humans voting? Okay, and so that's where all this got started. Okay, uh, Okay. and where's it used? Email services and so on. Okay, we mentioned several of these. Okay, so lots of places where it's used. Okay, so let's just be clear here. Uh, what's the rules of the game when you do a caption? Uh, it's supposed to be easy for humans to pass, okay? but difficult or ideally impossible for a computer to pass. Now remember, it's, there's sort of a Kirchhoff's principle here, right? So the computer gets access, or the attacker gets access to the CAPTCHA code, whatever data the code relies on. It knows all of that, knows how the thing works. I mean, how can this possibly work? How can you possibly prevent somebody from breaking it if they have the code? Okay, there's some random number in there. Right? There's some random number that the attacker doesn't know. And the random number uses to select from the data and to make distortions or whatever it's doing to uh, make the thing hard to read. Okay, look at it from Trudy's perspective. You get to know everything except the random number. You know, it's used to, uh, to uh, generate the specific CAPTCHA that you're trying to attack. So you better generate good random numbers. <laughs> Actually, have been attacks on these because the random numbers were not generated very well. So, okay, it's probably desirable to have a lot of different types, of, or at least a few different types of captchas. You know, maybe audio and visual captchas, if uh, nothing else. And many of them do have audio captchas, right? There's an option there to choose an audio captcha. Uh, here's an example. This one's kind of old now. You don't see ones like this too often uh, anymore. But the but you'd be given something like this, and it would say, you know, give me three words that appear in this particular uh, uh, image. Easy to do, right? Easy to find three or four words there. But from an automated point of view, how would you attack this? What would you do, have to do to find three or four words? OCR, there you go. Optical character recognition. That's the problem, okay? It's a standard problem, but it's hard because why? Why is it hard? Because no. the letters are distorted, they're squished together, they're run together, okay? So it's hard to figure out where the letters are and separate them out and all that sort of stuff, okay? So a hard OCR problem. Okay. Now, not surprisingly, since this CAPTCHA stuff has been uh, around, the quality of OCR has improved dramatically. <laughs> okay, people really have uh, started looking for ways to break these things. And this one, uh, I don't know about this one specifically, but some of the early uh, CAPTCHAs 
can now be attacked at a very high rate, you know, like 80 or 90 percent success because the OCR has improved so much <coughs> over the past few years. Okay, so there are visual captures like the previous one, and there are audio captures. The human ear is very good at filtering out noise, but trying to do that automatically is very difficult. So that's a, a good way to build a capture too. Um, okay, so here's kind of an interesting point. There's a really nice article. Uh, these guys at Carnegie Mellon who started doing the captcha stuff, uh, they wrote a short, you know, four or five page article, and it's called How Lazy Cryptographers Do Artificial Intelligence. What the heck? You know, what's that got to do with captions? Well, here's what they say. Um, they say, okay, OCR can be viewed as a artificial intelligence problem, right? Because if you do really good OCR, you're getting something that's closer to what humans do sort of naturally. So it's kind of an artificial intelligence problem. So what do you do? You create a CAPTCHA, you put it out there, and you let people try to attack it. Okay, now if they can attack it, that's good because you designed a strong CAPTCHA. If they can attack it, well, they've solved some hard AI problem. So you know, you've done some artificial intelligence just by putting the CAPTCHA out. That was easy. Okay, so in other words, you're taking that, those attackers' efforts and putting them to good use. <laughs> Very nice article if you ever want to look at that. Um, okay, there's several kind of uh, fundamental and the more people have studied this, they've sort of realized there are several fundamental problems that come up when you study uh, captures, at least the you know visual kind. Um, so the typical thing you see with letters and words, you know, pick the words out of this uh, thing. Um, there's one problem that uh, there's one part of the attack, if you're trying to attack this, that's known to be really hard for computers. Okay, Almost everything else that has to happen in the OCR, computers are at least as good as humans. But the one part where they fall down is so-called segmentation problem, which is just what you think. It's, it's the issue of how do you separate the letters? Okay? Where do you find the boundaries of the letters? If you can do that, then the OCR software today is so good, it's going to tell you what that letter is, no matter how much you distort it or twist it or you know, try to hide it. Okay, so that's why a lot of the CAPTCHAs you see today uh, do stuff like this. You know, maybe they run a letter, you know, they sort of run the letters together, you know, something like that. Okay, the idea being that it's hard to separate where the boundary is between those two letters. Okay, so relying on that segmentation problem. Uh, okay, so here's, a, here's another thing to think about. So, okay, so you want to attack a CAPTCHA, you're Trudy. You know, you want to get a thousand free email accounts, right? Um, but this CAPTCHA they're using is really hard to break. You can't do the OCR, you know, they, you, this segmentation problem, we can't solve it. What else could you do? Ask you. Let a lot of people try to solve it for you. All right, so, how, okay, so you could hire a bunch of people to solve it for That costs money, right? You're really going to pay people money to solve CAPTCHAs? You can. There's actually supposedly some going rate out there for solving CAPTCHAs. You could sit around all day solving CAPTCHAs if you want. I don't know what you make, but probably not a lot. <coughs> Any alternative to that? How might you get people to solve them for free for you? That would be even better. What's that? Reuse the captures on your own site. You must have a popular site. Yeah. <laughs> you become a professor and assign them to your students. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a good answer. Uh, well, folklore has it that uh, some group went out and created a website that advertised free porn. And all you had to do was solve the CAPTCHA. And so they would take the CAPTCHAs they wanted to solve, put them there, and just automate, automate the entire process. And they had a whole army of people out there solving CAPTCHAs for them. For them. Uh, it's kind of interesting if you go to the Carnegie Mellon website that talks about CAPTCHAs or their main website. They actually talk about this. And they say, it never happened. You know, well, OK, maybe it never happened. But it could. <laughs> it's certainly a plausible approach to solving uh, CAPTCHAs. So. 